A crown of thorns placed on his head He knew that he would soon be dead He said, did you forget me, father, did you? They nailed him to a wooden cross Soon all the world would feel the loss of Christ He hung his head and prepared to die Then lifted his face up to the sky Said, I am coming home now, Father, to you A reed which held his final sip Was gently lifted to his lips He drank his last and gave The soldier who had used his sword To pierce the body of our Lord Said truly this was Jesus Christ our Savior He looked with fear upon his sword Then turned to face his Christ and Lord Fell to his knees Took from his head the thorny crown And wrapped him in a linen gown Then laid him down to rest inside the tomb The holes in his hands, his feet inside Now in our hearts we know he died Three days went by, again they came To move the stone, to bless the slain With oil and spice anointing, hallelujah But as they went to move the stone They saw that they were not alone For Jesus Christ has risen
Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to Emmanuel. And as always, we'd like to extend a very special welcome to all of our guests today. As far as announcements go, we have a couple I need to bring up. The trustees will meet this coming Tuesday at 6 o'clock. If you're part of the trustees, please try to be here. I would uh, personally like to invite you all to be part of our Wednesday night Bible study. That's on Wednesdays. We start at 6 o'clock. We share a meal together. Johnny and Brenda is up for the meal this coming Wednesday. And from 6.30 to 7.30, we study the Word of God. We are through with Daniel, and Chip will take over. And I think he told me he's going to do uh, part of the book of Hosea. So if you want to read ahead a little bit, look at Hosea chapter 1, and that's what Chip will be teaching us about on Wednesday nights. Men's breakfast will be next Sunday morning. Um, we will eat at 8 o'clock, get here about 6.30, quarter to 7, start preparing. Uh, there should be leftovers for the women and children, whoever else wants to come be part of that. We usually cook plenty of food. Have I missed any announcements that anyone wants to bring up? Linda? Um, September 1st, September, The women are going to get together April 12th and go on a shopping trip to Savannah. And anyone that's interested can give me a call and I'll give the details. Okay. Thank you, Linda. So that's for the women's group. Anything else? Let's back for time. For Father Lord, hear our prayers, hear our cries, hear our requests. Hear us, Lord. We come before your throne with humble hearts. We come before your throne because we believe and we trust you. And we know that you are our God that can do anything that you choose to do. We pray, Father, today that the requests that we have made known are in your will. We pray for healings. We pray for blessings. We pray for comfort. We pray for guidance in all lives, whether it's ours or those that we lift up before you. Father, do a mighty work and do it for all your glory, none of our own. We thank you for this opportunity today to gather to together as a family, as a church family, as a family of God, and worship you and give thanks to you for your gift of Jesus, your Son, and for his gift of eternal life. And for the hope that we have because we believe in his resurrection. We pray, Father Lord, that you would just touch our hearts today as we worship you. You'll speak to us concerning matters of our lives that we need to deal with. Whether you're calling us to do ministry, or whether you're telling us things we're doing are not quite the way they ought to be and our lives are not up to par. Father, whatever you want to tell us, speak to our hearts today. May your word ring true. And may your Holy Spirit move among us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and join in as we sing because he lives.
death on the cross, but the resurrection that gives us all hope. This song talks about our place should have been on that cross. Or the tomb, 
and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. And Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And then went in also the, that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulchre, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had said, had thus said, she, was, she turned her back, herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. And Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said unto her, Mary. And she turned herself, and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. And Jesus said unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and your Father, and to my God, and your God. And Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, thanks be to God. You may be seated. Easter is definitely a special time time where we look at the scriptures and we see the culmination of what Jesus has been through, what he had planned, and what was going on. Easter is a time of both sacred and secular. And sometimes we have to weed through what is sacred, what is spiritual, and what is secular. You know, the, the word Easter itself comes from the Latin word estra. And estra was the goddess of light, a pagan god. Why was she part of Easter in our tradition today? Well, Esther being the goddess of light, and Easter time as we know it was a springtime thing, and in the spring, there seems to be more daylight as the days progress. And the days get longer. And therefore they attributed it to Estra, the goddess of light, because more light is coming about. Now, if we don't teach our kids and we don't understand ourselves, we can get a little bit of this pagan and a little bit of this sacred confused together. Easter is not really a Christian sacred word. It is a pagan word, a pagan god. That's where it comes from. Is it wrong to use it? Not necessarily. 
Will I get upset over it? No, I don't. Just like today. What does eggs and rabbits have to do with Easter? As you look at the scripture, you will find nothing. Okay? Nothing. Eggs are brought about because of fertility. In the spring, that's when the animal kingdom kind of ramp it up and we're going to have more animals later on. Eggs, fertility, all of this is part of springtime. It's really nothing to do with the resurrection, but it is life. Rabbits. I don't know a more fertile animal than a rabbit. They multiply tremendously. You think about rabbits, you think about life. The, Egypt, the Egyptians used used the rabbit as one of their symbols of fertility or producer of life. How do we tie this into Jesus? What greater producer of life than Jesus Christ? He not only gives us life, but life more abundant, eternal life a producer of great life. Should we be upset that kids run around with little hollow chocolate bunnies? No, I want some of them. I'll eat them. Should we be upset because they have Easter baskets and colored eggs? No. But be sure to teach them what is correct. Take a hard-boiled egg. Peel it. Cut it in half. Tell them that when Jesus died, he went into the tomb. The tomb can be represented by the hard shell of the egg. Break the tomb open. Take the egg out. Cut it in half. What do you have? You have the yellow yolk representing sunlight. Representing life. Don't let them just think Easter is all about eggs and rabbits. Use it to teach them a lesson that Easter is really about Jesus Christ and about him dying and going into the tomb and coming out of the tomb victorious and starting into a new life. Easter is an amazing time. Let me give you some facts. You may not like the way I word it, but for a, a secular world, it's kind of worded appropriately in my opinion. And that's all it is, is my opinion. And since I get to stand up here and preach, I get to give you a little bit of my opinion now and then. Fact, a man who claimed to be God was crucified on a skull-shaped hill called Calvary. He was confirmed dead by a Roman centurion. A Roman centurion knew what death was. Killed me, the leader of the killing. If anybody knew if somebody was dead, it would be this man. Fact, a man died on a cross and a Roman centurion verified. Second fact, he was buried in a brand new tomb, this guy was which was secured by a large stone. A seal was put around that stone and a detachment of soldiers was left to guard it. A little unusual. They went all out. Was it nothing to put somebody in a tomb, a sepulcher, to roll a stone door to, but to seal it? Make sure nobody opened it. And to leave a detachment of soldiers to guard it day and night, that was unusual. And probably they were going to guard it for four days. Now, we know you got Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We know three days. But normally, the Jews would talk about 
We're not sure they're dead until after day four. They felt like sometimes their spirit might hover around. They might be in a coma. They might come back to life. So, but if somebody was in a tomb for four days, well, their phrase is what our phrase might be. Surely by now they stink it. They verified that they'd been dead all along. Another fact. But the soldiers fled in terror because the stone was automatically rolled back and they were afraid. And they'd never seen anything like this. And the tomb was empty. And they did not know what to think. That was a fact. Another fact is, there were some visitors there, and they proclaimed that this man that had been buried in this tomb, that had died upon the cross and verified dead, was now alive. Those are all facts. Now, there are always those who deny facts. The denial of those facts is some of these, and they are filled. You need to know that this is not scripture, but theories that you see a little bit of it in scripture. Many theories out there. I'm going to name three or four. There is the theory that the body was stolen. Where was this man that was buried in this tomb? He's not here. What happened? And one theory is that the disciples snuck in while all the soldiers were asleep, which was a penalty of death on their part, if they all fell asleep, they all died. That was the penalty. They dared not fall asleep. But to make the story sound true, they had to lie and say, we all fell asleep, we were so tired. The Passover had come, all these Jewish people, all this carrying the cross up the Via Della Rosa, the way of sorrows, and nailing several people to the cross. And doing all of this stuff, we were just tired. So we fell asleep. And the disciples snuck in and moved the stone and stole the body. That's a theory that they put around. There's a second theory. He didn't die. He wasn't dead after all. Oh, he'd been beaten really bad. Crown of thorns on his head. Nailed to a cross. A spear thrust into his side. But he wasn't dead. He just fainted. And he woke up. And he physically removed that heavy stone that probably took several men to put in place. He's been through all of this, and yet he had the strength to move the stone on his own and walk away. Again, while the soldiers slept. That's another theory. There's other theories. The disciples really did see Jesus. They saw a ghost. We believe in ghosts. We saw a ghost. It must have been Jesus. Because he's not in the tomb. We really don't believe he's alive. It must be a ghost. And then one of my favorites is, oh, you can't believe none of that. It's all made up. It's a made up story. Can't prove any of it. How can a man come back to life? Surely, he's just one of the thieves, one of the crimes. You see, we have some facts, and we have some denial of facts. Paul writes in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 5 through 9, that when Jesus was seen, he was seen by his family, he was seen by his friends, the disciples, he was seen by the faithful believers, 
Matter of fact, at one time, he was seen by as many as 500 people at one time. Talk about standing up in court. You walk in with 500 people saying, yep, we saw him. He's alive. He's walking around. Sure. We should believe it. There again, what do we make of the Bible? Is it the Word of God? Is it true? Or is it just a bunch of stories? You see how you approach the Bible tells me how you're going to approach the things in the Bible, the Word of God. It tells me, are you a cafeteria type Bible reader? Or are you all in? Hadn't been to a cafeteria type place. Well, I did go over to the hog trough, the uh, uh, old timer buffet. And he, so I did some kind of a buffet. But I remember the old style buffets. You didn't get it yourself. You went through a line and you pointed out and said, I want some of that, I want some of that. I don't like that. And I want some of that. And you picked and you chose. There are people that approach the Bible that way. I want a whole lot of heaven. I don't believe in hell, so I don't want none of the hell. I don't want none of the stuff that's going to make me feel guilty. Some reason the Bible makes me feel guilty, so I don't want to believe that part. How easy it is for us to just pick and choose. But there are those who believe the Bible is the Word of God. It is the truth of God. That men, when they sat down and wrote the Word of God, were inspired by God, filled with the Holy Spirit, couldn't make a uh, mistake if they wanted to because God was guiding them, speaking to them, and using them. It's just that we may not understand it all and interpret it all correctly. But I believe it to be true. And I don't have smarts enough. And don't get me wrong, I'm supposedly highly educated. I made it through grammar school. I made it through high school, barrel. I made it through college. I made it through seminary. I'm certifiable, educated, but if you listen to me, you may think, he's darn dirt because he's just a mountain redneck. But I'm smart enough to know this. I'm not smart enough to pick and choose what's correct, what's real, and what's false in the Bible. So I believe it all. I accept it all. I accept it as the Word of God. So that's my basis. And therefore, since I believe it, I believe what it teaches. And I believe that Paul wrote that 500 people saw Jesus at one time. 500 people saw Jesus at that time. And he was alive. And this was after his crucifixion, death, and burial, and resurrection before his ascension into heaven. Folks, we either believe the resurrection or we don't. And if we believe it, we need to believe everything that it teaches us and what goes along with it. And Jesus has risen. He is alive. And because He is alive, we can be alive through faith in Him. We become alive in Him forevermore. Our bodies will die. They will. But our souls will never die. We will, in essence, live forever. And one day this old body, the Bible teaches, will dry up and turn back to the ashes of the dust of the world. But we will be given a brand new body. And it's going to be tremendous. One of these days, all these aches and pains are going to be gone. One of these days, we're going to have a body that will last forever. One of these days, we're going to have a body that I believe we can eat all the chocolate we want to and won't be a diabetic. We can be in shape without having to exercise. Wouldn't that be tremendous? Now, what's that body going to look like? Well, I think the perfect head is a bald head. And you may think the perfect head is covered in hair. You may think the perfect body is weighing 150 pounds. 
I used to think the perfect body was 360, and then I realized I was wrong. So I had to lose a little weight, try to get down to whatever my body says. My doctor says, you're losing weight, your body will become what it wants to become. Just don't worry about it. If I got worried, I'm losing too much weight. But he said, don't worry about it. The body will get back to where it wants to be. Right now, my body, is, it gives me a fit, but it does what it wants to do. Some of you ready to relate to that. You realize that the body gets older, the body wears out, the body does what it wants to, we have to fight with it, we argue with it, and we say, come on now, come on. I can still run in my mind, but not so fast with my feet. I still got balance in my mind. I don't fall out of boats in my mind. My body would show something different. I took up bowling. I hadn't been bowling in 20, 30 years. Boy, did I hurt. I still hurt. And where I used to bowl fairly well, not on the level of some of you all, I don't bowl nowhere near that. And I have to bowl. Listen, these old bodies give us a fit. One day we're going to have a brand new one. And it's going to be awesome. And all my loved ones that's going on and shed this old tent that Paul talks about. I'm going to see them with their brand new bodies. And I'm going to get to spend all eternity with them. The resurrection. It's true. It's important. It's the main thing in the gospel message. That Jesus died and he arose. And he lives forevermore. Now that's all introduction. Now I've got my points to make. So you hang on for a minute. We're going to talk about Mary Magdalene for a minute. And we read the story before she went to the tomb. And I want to highlight a couple of things. The first thing I saw in reading about Mary and her realizing that the tomb was empty and that Jesus was not there is that she was distressed. She was upset. She had cried for a day or two because her Lord and Savior had been killed on a cross and put in a tomb. And she couldn't get to him. And now she's going to go to that tomb. And she gets there and the stone is rolled away. And he's not there. And her thoughts was somebody stole the body. What did they do with it? And I can see her distress because of her love for the Lord Jesus. The next thing I see in her is her discovery. She ran back and told the disciples, somebody stole Jesus. They looked at her and said, what are you talking about? Somebody stole Jesus. Jesus. The tomb's open. The stone's rolled back. He's not there. <coughs> well, Peter and the other disciple want to see for themselves. So they head out, running. Now, Peter's a little bit slower than the other disciple. The other disciple got there first. Peter come in second. But the other disciple stopped and looked at him. Peter, you know, was always the one that was the boldest. He didn't stop. He got to the tomb, and he just went straight on in. He wanted to see everything. He wanted to see what's going on. And Mary comes, and she's hanging out. And Peter didn't seem to be giving any answers. The other disciple didn't seem to have any answers. And as they looked around, they were looking, but they weren't taking it all in. All they saw was, Jesus is gone. Jesus is gone. And if you pay close attention, the linen that wrapped his body is in one place, and the napkin that covered his head was in another place. 
The napkin that covered his head was folded. There's meaning to that. All the Jewish people knew they had servants. That they took a meal, and a servant always watched to see what they needed to do for their master. A servant knew full well that as the meal was taken, that if the master was done, if he was finished, when he got up to walk away from the table, he just wadded that napkin up and threw it down on the table next to the plate. And the servant knew now's the time to clear the table, clean it up. The master is done. But if the master had to get up and go take care of something, had to do something, had to walk away for a few minutes, and was coming back, he would take that napkin and he would fold it and he would lay it, lay it neatly beside the plate. Yes. And that told the servant, the master's coming back. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he folded the napkin and laid it to the side. And he was symbolizing, I'm coming back, folks. I'm coming back. I'm not done. I'm not finished completely. I'm coming back. Peter and the other disciple missed some of that. And they went back to join the other disciples. But Mary hung around. And in her discovery, she happened to see the angels. And began listening to them. And they were saying, why are you crying? Who are you seeking? And we see her distress. And we see her discovery. But we see her disinterest. She saw that somebody else was there also. And she turned her back on the disciple, on the angels. And she looked at one that she thought was a gardener. But it was actually Jesus himself. One of these days I'll get these pieces of paper apart. And we see that she was no longer interested in angels. These that were clothed in white garment. That probably had a glow to them. Now, if we came up on angels, and they had a glow to them, and they were speaking, they would catch our attention. We would probably be like the shepherds in the field that the angels came into the sky there and spoke to the shepherds and told them about the birth of Jesus. And it says that the shepherds were sore afraid. Mary was so focused on, where's Jesus? Where's my Lord? What have they done with him? And she missed the angels in a while. And when she turned and she saw Jesus, we see her despair even in talking to him. Where's Jesus? What have they done with his body? Did you take his body? Please help me. Help me find him. I want to take care of him. He took care of me. And I want to honor him. But then Jesus spoke. And we see Mary's delight. And Jesus simply called her by name. And said, Mary. And she looked at him. And realize it's Jesus. He's alive. She wanted to grab him. She wanted to hug him. She probably had tears in her eyes. She wanted to worship him. She wanted to rejoice. And he had to say, please, Mary, you can't touch me right now. I'm not ascended to be with my father. The purity of it all. But I do need you, Mary, to go tell the disciples and tell others that I'm alive. 
that I have come back. Go tell me. And Mary, I imagine she ran to tell the disciples. And she began to tell them all that she had heard and all that she had seen. And they thought, Mary's having a rough day. She showed up a few hours ago, and she tells us the body's gone. And now she's back, and she tells us she's seen him, and he's alive. And the disciples wasn't sure to make of that. And even Thomas, what did he say? Unless I see the scars in the hands, the feet, and the sides, I don't believe it. It was a tough day that day. But they all come to know he's alive. He's alive. He's alive, folks. And right now, with us, in Emmanuel, he's alive. He is with us. He is watching us. You may have come to church today as many other times and sat in a pew <coughs> and considered yourself a spectator, an observer, and you want to watch the music and listen to the music and maybe participate a little bit in the music. You may want to watch the preacher. Does he motivate me? Does he get excited? Is he crazy? Is he pre preaching the truth? And you're observing and watching. And maybe you might be motivated to come to the altar at the end and make a decision or just sit there and make decisions or pray about things. But you know what? The real observer, the real spectator today is Jesus Christ himself. For the word has been preached. It has been sung. <coughs> we have prayed. And he has watched us. And he has looked into our hearts. And he knows us. And he is observing. Did I leave the stove on? Kids going to show up at 12 to eat lunch together. We'll be through here in a few minutes and I'll hurry home. Or go with some friends out to eat. Or what's in your mind right now? What is Jesus observing of you right now? Is he observing a heart of love for him? A heart of repentance for sins in our lives? Is he looking into our hearts and seeing hearts that want to make some new commitments or even a first time commitment for salvation? What is he seeing in us? Is he seeing in me as a pastor that I have truly done my best to pre preach the word today and to share with you what he has given me? What is he looking at in our lives? Where he is looking, folks. He is alive. He is risen. And he loves us. And he's watching over us. And he cares about us. And he's wanting to reach down and touch our hearts and fellowship with us and be Lord of our lives. But we have to allow that. He never, ever makes us. He loves us and says, I'm here for you. If you will receive me, if you want more of me, I'm here for you. Folks, He loves you so dear. This morning, as we have an invitation time before we uh, have communion, before we celebrate together the Lord's Supper, I will.
they give you an opportunity to come. Paul taught us that some had even died taking communion unworthily. And what he was saying there is that at times we come to the Lord's table and we don't take it serious and we don't get ourselves in the right place spiritually to really understand it and commune with Jesus. This is your time. Paul's going to come right now. Chris is coming. They'll come on and in just a moment we'll stand and sing. And during this time, if you want to come, and pray, kneel, if you can't kneel because of the knees or whatever, we'll stand and pray. If you want me to pray with you, I'm over here. This is your time. I always emphasize it. This is your time. Don't come because of me. Don't because you come because of anything else. And don't not come because you're worried what anybody else thinks. This is your time to really be close to Jesus. If you need to come today, you come. And then afterwards, we'll have a time of communion together. Would you stand? Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and Heaven and earth full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin, uh, slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ offered for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ, Christ is risen, Christ, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. 
by your spirit and make us one with Christ and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now we invite all of you that wish to participate to join us in communion. And would you come now?